Welcome back, everyone. This segment is brought to you by Black Hills Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to request a quote today. And by the Sands Institute, the most trusted source for computer security training certification and research. Visit sands.org to learn more. And by Tenable Network Security, the creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Jumpstart your security program today and evaluate Security Center CV, the continuous monitoring solution. And by Tenable HR, we need to throw that one in there too. That wasn't in the show notes. Chris! 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 <laughs> we can't miss a sponsor. There you go. I don't know what I'm supposed to read here, but I'll make some stuff up. Tenable's a great place to work. You should come work with me and Jack. Absolutely. You can do that That's by going to securityweekly.com forward slash Tenable Jobs. All kinds of... Uh, oh, security hey, consultant? You, Did you yeah, see that yeah, one? yeah. So, uh, you know Nessus? That'd be cool. We can, we can teach you Nessus. We got people that know that. No scripting, API work, um, you know, not, not super deep. And if you can uh, help folks uh, get the most out of our systems, particularly Nessus, but um, work with customers and uh, make a difference in the field for uh, our customers using our products, uh, and that, that would be that's fantastic. That's a full-time uh, security consultant full -time, uh, Yeah, full-time role. It is, it is remote work. It uh, is remote. That was the point I wanted to make there. And it is, there is some travel up to 40%, uh, but it uh, I think there's a little flexibility there, but some travel required, but uh, you do not have to travel. You do not have to travel to the office on a daily basis. That's right. Um, so, um, yeah, that's that's one uh, working out in the field with folks. So if you're interested in that, that would be outstanding. We have a ton of jobs. Uh, Tons. Tons of jobs. They are 90-plus uh, percent, uh, conservatively 90-plus percent are due to growth. You know, um, we have yeah. uh, we have a lot of positions. We're growing uh, dramatically. Another one that folks might be interested in are the uh, the variety of uh, sales engineer positions. So yeah, we haven't talked about those in the show. <clears throat> no, uh, actually, we could you know, sometime. I we ought to get Steve on to talk about yeah. it. But it's I work very closely with the sales engineers too. I I, I do too, and it's uh, you know you get to go out and help people make their environments more secure, and um, uh, it's you could. You get to uh, help folks make their environment more secure, help them get the most out of their investment in tenable stuff, mm -hmm. uh, get out in the get out in the world, and we're uh, adding a lot of folks in those roles to build tighter relationships and communities. So that's another one. There are plenty more on the website uh, to check out. If you have questions, certainly ping Paul or I, or uh, reach out to HR directly. But uh, yeah, happy to talk about and, uh, that. Looks like Larry will be back in Las Vegas. I'm sure he's going out there <coughs> to DefCon. Uh, Larry never misses yep. a DEF CON. Right. He'll also be back out there in September, on September 14th through the 19th, teaching SAN 617 wireless ethical hacking and defense, uh, and at lots more places as well. So cool. make sure, uh, cool. yeah, uh, SAN usually has that conference Sands, in September. Yeah, the September conference. Yeah. That's one of the, I think, uh, not to say that they're not all great, but that's one of the conferences where the folks that attend, uh, they get a, a good turnout of, of really engaged people. When I find we've that done too. That, yeah, I when find we've that done too. that uh, as at Tenable and other times, uh, that one's one of the um, really well attended and well engaged mm -hmm. uh, communities. Uh, I mean, I think they're all fantastic, but yeah. that one really there there are a lot of folks that are really drilling in. They're they're trying to. I don't know. Maybe the kids are back in school and they just want to run away for a, a couple of weeks. I, I mean, for a week. I, I don't know, but the, anyway, that's a good one. Larry will be there. Um, all right, yeah. so what are we talking about? Oh, I don't know. Well, are we starting off in, like, full rant mode? Um, we All can right. ease in, or we can just launch. I mean, oh, I, I've got a couple of stories. I have a couple of stories I was going to put in there, but you've got enough. I don't see chipper pin listed. I don't think we can rant today. No, um, so my rant, Sig. my rant is about a certain <laughs> media entity, <clears throat> Wired, uh, who I linked to a story that's not linked to Unwired on purpose, but rather links to a specific graphic, which kind of shares some of my feelings about that. So, dear Wired, you led in with your original article on the topic of the Cardinals hacking the Astros. That's baseball for those not in so much into sports. Dear God, those baseball yeah. people will try anything to make that sport interesting. Won't yeah. they? <laughs> <laughs> but they Shit. led in with the article and talked about Patriot Spygate, and then I just I lost it. I, I lost <sighs> it. So f you wired. Uh, so go <laughs> wow. read threat post for real tech journalism where they're Ooh. not making analogies. 
because they wrote a nice article on this uh, particular story, uh, which states that the attack apparently involved Cardinals officials allegedly using passwords previously used by a, an employee, another former Cardinals executive, to gain access to the Astros' internal databases. So there were some like people leaving one team, going to the other administration, and then so hey, my password still works. The only thing works. new about this is that it's a sporting team, right? Because credential reuse by former employees. Yes. That was Man, my point I've never heard story. that one before, except pretty much every time you have a conversation. Yeah. Um, it's bad, dude. It, it's and that's it's, but it's an easy problem to it's solve. An e- it's it's a problem to solve, but you know, I mean, it, it's um, yeah, whatever. But the, and and is password reuse hacking? I mean, it's unauthorized access, right? It's CFAA. Who was Absolutely. it? Absolutely. ESPN it, wrote an article. Somebody at ESPN wrote an article that claimed it wasn't criminal. Uh, that cl- right, so talk about the ESPN. I don't know what it is they do well. I've been trapped in front of ESPN at, at like hotel bars <laughs> and stuff, and apparently mm-hmm. they don't do sports well, and they don't do <laughs> security. Ha- they don't do ha- security news well. They should do whatever it is they do well. I, d- I don't well, know, you what know what it is. You know they do well. They are a media mogul. I mean, they've got the TV, radio. The internet thing, the like bars, figured out, right. dude. They, they like, do. Yeah, they and are and like, it's, it's, yeah, um, they are on point. Now their it, content, content sucks, mm-hmm. but you know, it's anyway. Right, never mind. Sports ball. Um, uh, anytime, I'm wa- anytime I'm watching a game, this is the most interesting thing that's happened right, in, in baseball, baseball in like years. People, <laughs> people want to kill us too, right? Because <laughs> the, the metrics people love baseball. It's like, wait, if you're putting that much effort into the, if you're putting effort into math while watching baseball, I think it proves my point, though. Yeah, I know. Don't. don't I, I, can do, I, I, I did some math. Partially tongue in cheek, and it's very, way. it's a very calculated thing. The Red Sox suck this year. Yeah, that's, actually, I don't think you really need math. That's, that's not big number math. No, uh, that's no. not even algebra, right? That's, <laughs> that's. Here's the here's the flip side though, because you know what's interesting <sighs> is I, I saw the headline on this and I was like, oh, okay, and I moved along, but. <laughs> what a great opportunity. I mean, most uh, there's a lot of organizations that love baseball. There's a lot of executives that that like sports. And this is not an analogy. This is an example. This yeah, right. happened. Yes. And, and, you know, Jack, I love the fact where you said, well, they reused the password. Is that really hacking? What? A, I mean, guys, Jack just gave us the perfect way to have that conversation in the organization and say, mm-hmm. hey, you know how we talk about when somebody leaves, we should know that they left and we should shut down their accounts? Yeah, that's why. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we just gave right. people we don't, a very simple it, explanation. To and we don't have to use words like hacking because the word criminal <laughs> applies, yes. right? Yeah. You know, uh, we argue about where CFAA gets applied. If you steal intellectual property, um, that's stealing intellectual property. That's like kind of a crime and probably should be right. It is. It is an opportunity to have a conversation and. and not hype and fun. <laughs> I, I'm sure that there are people listening now. I'm sure there are people also, uh, hosts and co-hosts, who've been in the situation of abusing your power as a systems or network administrator to wow. gain access to personnel records that you shouldn't have access to just so that you can keep up with terminated employees and secure the environment, which is one of those double-edged swords of, of the admin, right? I, and I... I will freely admit to abusing access, uh, to gain access to HR records to make sure that I knew when people were terminated to uh, revoke access back when I had to work for a living. And I like the that caveat you added that, to that. And that ain't right. Oh, it's you a qualifier. Know? <laughs> that ain't right. No, well, it, uh, <clears throat> So last pass, last pass even was. <laughs> oh dear God! Segway. Should we? <clears throat> is that enough? Panic? <laughs> is that? <laughs> go, go. The world is no. It just ended. <laughs> Should we panic? Um, you know, I I love their um, I love their disclosure statements. They were very upfront about things, uh, which is always appreciated. Of course, it's a survivability of business issue with them ultimately. So, um, I guess they had every motivation and reason to be very upfront. Uh, um, but um, but I, I've seen that, a lot of nonsense were, around that, it. Well, their their hashes were compromised. They have some Was strong, it a wired article? <laughs> they have some strong, strong hashing algorithms. <laughs> if you used a very strong key for your master password vault, 
um, you have uh, a reason to be uh, slightly concerned, I believe, but not reason to panic. Um, well, here's if, the here's the facts on that. Uh, fact, on if you job. use second factor, you're in much better shape. Yeah. Go ahead. So the the facts are. Um, so Robert Graham did uh, a little scientific experiment and kind of replicated their um, PBKDF2 algorithm. Uh, and can right. give us some numbers to go by. So a five-letter mm -hmm. password has a billion combinations, so a fast computer can guess it in a second. Um, so add one letter, 64 different possibilities, 64 times harder. Basically, a seven-character password becomes an hour, eight is several days, nine is a year, 10 is 64 years, 11 is 1,000 years, and 12 is a million years. So what my recommendation was, have a 14-character password. Uh, to account for I've growth in computing, enable two-factor authentication, change your password if this, you know, if you're using LastPass. In, I, yeah, I think change you're your master. Shape. I've yeah. never used a password. I've, I've been a LastPass user for many, many years. In the early days of password managers, it was one of the first multi, you know, cross-platform mm -hmm. yep. ones. Uh, the others have caught up now. Uh, but I was looking through a different encrypted archive that I use, I have never used less than a 27-character passphrase mm -hmm. on for the master because you put too much in. And the tr it's all a matter of trade-off and risk, right? right. I realized I, I, I changed my master password um, and looked at the security profile that it gives you, and it says, hey, here's the machine, you know, here are a list of hosts that have reported compromises since the last time you ran this. You ought to change, you know, your Uber yep. and your Live. It's like, I know I changed both of those since then, but let's change them again. Mm -hmm. They have an automatic password change tool, which is, eh, it, it's a great idea. It's, mm -hmm. it's not 100%, but it's pretty good. But in going through it, I found a bunch of duplicates, blew out the duplicates. You know, like when you sign up for an account, oh, yeah. it's it's register.widgets.com. Mm -hmm. And then next time you log in, it's just widgets.com. Oh, so LastPass doesn't <coughs> handle it so, any better well, than it, one password. Right, one password no, but it, you, that, yeah. you dump them all out and you like blow out the duplicates. Mm -hmm. And then you look at the ones you haven't changed the password in a decade or, you know, three or four years. Like, ah, oh, I needed. And I went through and I dropped 50 of the 500 passwords last night. Uh, just like, oh, that's a dead account. Oh, that company, you know, they don't yeah. exist anymore. Clean it all. Jack, how long did that take you? Uh, it took a couple of hours, but it was while I was supposed to be paying attention to other things like conference <laughs> calls, right? <laughs> so it wasn't quality time. Um, and, it, you know, you pick up wherever you leave off and you just keep, you know, diving back in. And, and it encourages you to use... Yep strong passwords in a bunch of places and it, it nags at you if you if you have duplicate passwords mm -hmm. and it really encourages you to have better password um, sanitization well the so other the, thing the trade-off uh, is you know it, it is a single point of compromise there are a couple of things people have said like you know but if you intercept it on the way it's like it, it's you're not going to do a downgrade attack you're not going to downgrade this and get the master no. password in clear text they're they're not so that, so they're, my uh, my master password uh, for LastPass is some 28 characters. And, and I think this is an opportunity um, for us to reinforce that. You know, if you're using a password vaulting application, make sure your master key is something incredibly long. Uh, complex if you want it to be, but incredibly long being the, being the real point. I like and sentences. You, sentences are great. Sentences are great. Mine's not, 28, not mine's the first, 28 characters. Great. Not when, the first when, line of, sh of famous Shakespeare or anything else. Right. Use guess. something yeah. that, that's a sentence that's meaningful to you and not meaningful to anybody else. But um, and, and employ your second factor. I, I um, wasn't employing my second factor, uh, and I'm guilty of that. I fished out my YubiKey. I set it up for a one-time password. I immediately reactivated it with LastPass. Uh, and intend on changing my uh, so the uh, the my challenge key. with that is if you're using it across multiple devices devices and yeah. types yeah. of devices it is so I don't know where I stick a YubiKey in my iPhone you know well that that exactly it and there's exceptions for that so uh, in in oh switch. yeah yeah I'm, NFC yeah, yeah, key. Chris that's good, YubiKey makes a uh, an NFC, NFC device, device. And, uh, yeah. that means turning on NFC in my mobile device and I know. Yeah, better than, I don't know. Yeah, people people yeah, right. have to You're be really close. Not a real big believer in they that. Be, well, I get I get really close to a lot of people, you know. Well, you know, yeah. she, well, then she'd have to be a spy. So the chances you're going to get really close to a female spy or male spy, for that matter. But, but my point that I wanted probably to drive pretty home good, Jackson. So yeah, you're probably right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my point I wanted to drive home for our listeners is if you wait, you had a point. A, a very oh. long. Are you new here? Oh no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you're killing me, Jack. If using a very long. 
uh, <laughs> passphrase that is unique and meaningful to you, your chances of brute force or dictionary attack success are pretty limited in an offline attack. And what this compromise means is those hashes are going to be subject to an offline attack, which means massive amount of dictionary and brute force attempts against the hashes that were, that were I, captured. I do want to point out that LastPass did something that I thought was really smart. They said if they activated a mechanism that said if someone accesses your LastPass from a computer that is new, it hasn't seen before, it hasn't seen before, it's going to validate them through email. So they yep. will have had to so compromise your email and they, account. They, you know, their That's blog a very posts, nice thing, yeah. Their blog posts have been, like, they answered the question, why did I hear about this in the media before I got an email? And they're like, we had to email all of our customers. And so we distributed them in batches, uh, but we also reported to the media so that we would get the word out as fast as possible. It's like, well, okay, that makes sense. I mean, I got, I got my email... Uh, within an hour and 45 minutes or so of hearing mm -hmm. of the breach originally. You know, some people it took m longer than that. Uh, I don't know what the sequence was. I don't know if it was alphabetic or how long you've been a user. But, um, you know, back to, you know, Joff, to your point. Uh, so offline attacks. In the math that Rob Graham did for us, um, if you... Uh, if you had an eight-character password, it takes several days to break. Well, if you know something as valuable as LastPass has any kind of compromise at all, hopefully uh, you're going to change your master password within several days, right? So even at eight, you have time, you have a couple of days to change it. Um, at, at, at nine characters, it's a year. Uh, don't take a year to change your password. And it, this isn't just, you know, generic... Um, Advice for, for LastPass. This applies across a lot of, you know, highly sensitive things. Now, the one thing that I did note that they said was basically don't forget your passwords because if you change them and you forget, there is the capability of doing a rollback. And I understand why they do that. Because you you're revert, old and you forget. You revert to the last one, <laughs> but the last one's already been compromised, so you need to revert to that. That's problematic. Yeah, it's like having a taped backup of a virus, and then when you go to yeah, restore, it, so you that's a that's back. a challenge. Um, so yeah, I don't know about all right. Reverting. So let, uh, let's flip it around for a sec. This again, another it made the rounds, and I think I saw somebody say, you know, hey, this is great for LastPass. How can they get this kind of name recognition any other way? And for the most part in the security community, nobody's upset about it. These things happen because, you know, it's going to happen. They're a, a high-profile target. But, guys, if, if you've listened to this conversation, we're still dabbling in the tech side of it, and we're still using our jargon. So when we lament that people don't understand passwords and they haven't figured it out, yeah, because we haven't translated it yet for them to, to figure it out. So, you know, it... it if somebody comes and asks you about this, just be mindful of the fact that when you say to them, well, it should be blah, 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 characters and complexity if you want, whatever. If you go too fast and you're, and you're not capable of explaining it yourself, I mean, look, I, I ask people a lot of times uh, in, in the security space to define the difference between a dictionary and a brute force attack, and they get very confused. So just 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 be at this point just be mindful of that. Like this is a great opportunity to have a conversation. All the advice is great, but if somebody looks at you kind of uh, cross-eyed, slow down. Go to a whiteboard. Talk them through it to the best of your ability. Well, I mean, it's, it's it's but it's simple. It really is. No, simple, Michael. it's simple to you. You've been doing this for years. Yeah, but it it is a matter of length. It just the, the, the no argument. To, I've done the yeah, math too. Where's Larry when just, we need him? I know. <laughs> you keep coming back to that. <laughs> Well, yes, yeah, and you know, Paul, just, you, you suggested right. a sentence, and I will take that over something else, but now there's some empirical data that, that they can actually use sentence structure against you. So the, the, the single best thing to do is to use four or five different nouns that are unrelated, but then string them together. The pa the, but, the, but ultimately, in the stronger solution, the passphrase itself is even, is even suffering weakness, right, is what, you, you're, what you're really just alluding to. So that's where you come to second factor. So what yeah, I would say to people is... I'm, I'm on board with you 100%. Okay. But what I'm saying to the audience, though, is, you know, yes, go with length. But yes, go with second factor. Go with something you possess, a one-time password key generator. And then you are in a much better position because you've got, you've got two items that are going to be broken. And it's unlikely they're going to so be... So what you're saying is, Joff, length, girth, and the right position are your exactly. keys to success. <laughs> the gotcha. keys to success. That's what I got I from that. 
can I play devil's advocate here for a yeah, second? Go ahead, Kevin. No, Kevin. no, damn it. So, all right, <laughs> let's get back into the technical weeds for for a second. Please At the do. beginning of this the show, we were all harping on OneDrive, iCloud, these cloud services. Is do we trust it? I don't know. Maybe. Yet we put all our passwords in the cloud, and they just got popped. Why? Yeah, why do we? Why not, do we trust but this? But they're not. But, the but passwords wait, aren't in the cloud. Um, native, you guys just right? sound like a bunch of cackling old ladies. The, the passwords, <laughs> not, you were like, rah, rah. the password, uh, the hashed passwords, which by the way have unique salts per user, right? So there isn't a single salt. So there, there is encrypted data in the cloud, mm-hmm. right. um, and you know the decryption is done in the browser. Um, is it perfect? No. Does it allow me to have? What did I get? 375 or so unique passwords across 401 or two sites. Yeah. So, so it's, you know, that, there's a that trade-off. That's, and, the, well, that's and, Jack's point. That's the big win. Right. But is, so yeah. it's convenience or is it transparency? Why do we trust these services more than OneCloud and Google Drive? Oh, no. The, the big win Purpose. is... The, big, the, uh, the, here's why you trust LastPass. I, I'm going to end this conversation... Here is why you trust LastPass. Because when they first came out, Steve Gibson told me it was safe. (laughs) (laughs) Cue the clip. Cue the clip. I think think Kevin's asking the right question, but but let me frame it differently. What OneDrive or iCloud or Dropbox is trying to do is infinitely more complex, and it needs to have a lot more flexibility to it. And it was built from the ground up for sharing. I mean, if you look at Dropbox, when they got started – uh, I talked to their CTO and I said, hey, tell me about your security model. He said, oh, we just want to be like email. I said, well, email is not secure. He goes, yeah, I know. Okay. But if you go to LastPass, they were designed from the ground up. They said, look, we, we get this. We understand passwords. We understand authentication. We understand we're going to be a target. So they're going to design it differently. And, and I actually mm-hmm. think that's a really salient point to make for people because the question then when you're looking at a cloud service, right, this is a SaaS level, something in the cloud, is to say, well, for what purpose was it built? Who did the building? And what's our level of confidence with it? So the fact that they have been so forthright with this and that we're able to analyze it and have really good but detailed technical commentary on it. So we've got a good level of confidence. So if somebody now comes to us and says, so I saw LastPass was in the headlines. No, no, that's okay. As Joff said, if you can do second factor, add that. Make sure you have a long password. But, uh, you can use five I, nouns. But I still, think, I still think Jack's point of Steve Gibson said Trumps. I, I I'm with your you. answer, Mike. Yeah, no, I, I can't, I, I, I can't I, argue that. Let the hate mail flow. Right, we're gonna get hate yeah, mail now. We Jack. are. We are. No, um, I really have got to reinforce another point. That the one of the unique beauties of using uh, a password vaulting s- solution like this that is really well designed is that it enables you to use a high degree of unique and complex yeah. passwords on every service you're using. Yep, and that has a multiplicative effect on your security level, which is huge, huge. Yep. Yeah, think about that, right? This is the the comment I make, you know, and and I've actually part of the reason I was so stringent about this in the beginning is because I've actually spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to break down and explain these topics to people. But you know, Jeff, if you if you ask most people how many passwords they can remember, they're not even necessarily good passwords. Uh, it's like four, maybe yeah, five, three, four, so five. It, it, so yeah. the minute you introduce them to a password manager and you say, look. You can press a button. It will select one long enough. You know what I love is they start getting pissed like I do when you're limited. It's something, well, your password can't be longer than 11. What oh, do you mean? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> oh, and a, and a, re- a related <laughs> tangent. If you, run a, if you run a website and don't allow copy, yes. paste, or autofill into the fields, oh. you suck. Screw you. Stop Make, it. Look, you're I making wanna, us wanna, less I secure. I want to ask a uh, usability question. If you enter your username on one page and then you have to go to the next page to enter your password does LastPass handle that no last because because it's two different things and you have yeah. and so generally it's like hey oh which one do you want me to enter here well it depends on how many you've got so if it's say Some, sometimes a it google where you have multiple google accounts it's mm-hmm. like uh which username you want here it's like you put that one in there it's like oh jesus all right put and it does not remember because mm-hmm. it's not a stateful transaction or anything. Yeah. So that is that is a challenge. Um, so I don't put things like my bank credentials in a last pass or one password because I'm paranoid. To speak to your point, Kevin, like there is a certain level of paranoia I have as well about my passwords being in the cloud. 
But um, but the bank, one of the, my banks that I have, it's you enter your usernames plural on one screen and then your password on the next page. So you actually D- can't, depending on you how you hit it. Gmail. Yeah. Um, I've noticed Gmail and Chrome on one of my machines now gives you two pages, one one each. It, yeah. It's inconsistent. I want to. I want to. Your story number eight about yeah. Hacker One yeah. goes all sorts of directions. First, hmm. um, Hacker One when they when they became popular really kind of validated this this field of like bug crowdsourced bug stuff because Casey Ellis, Casey uh, uh, Bug Crowd founded you know Bug Crowd years and years ago, and I remember hearing him on Pat Gray's podcast on mm-hmm. Risky Business, and I thinking you know years ago. That's a really cool idea. I hope it takes off, uh, but I wonder if the market will buy it. And it took them a while, but, you know, it's taken off, and, and Hacker One's a little different. And we, we've we got friends there. Katie Mazuris is at Hacker One now. Um, and Stephen oh, Toulouse. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah Katie's there oh, now. Oh, okay. So, so the Katie's guys from there. Hacker One, so just to give people the background, yeah. if you know what Hacker One is, um, a bunch of guys and gals, perhaps, um, found a whole bunch of security bugs in... The top 100 or 100 companies, yep, and tried to disclose all of them to those 100 companies. Surprisingly, no one, to my knowledge, got arrested and no one was sued. And I was amazed by that. So they decided to form a company that right. helps bridge security researchers with right. companies to disclose vulnerabilities. And if there's any faith that I have in a company, it's by the people who found vulnerabilities in a hundred different companies and managed not to get arrested or sued. Right. To right. me, that's, that's amazing. That's, that's, that's amazing. 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 And they have a different model, and they've, they've got some financing. Yeah, uh, they, they took $9 it, million. And as a, as a further tangent, because it's me, uh, one of the people that has fairly recently joined HackerOne, well, in the past several months, is uh, Stepto, Stephen Toulouse, who mm-hmm. was at Microsoft Security for years uh, and then was, like, the security dude for Xbox. Yep. And uh, he joined, uh, for those that haven't heard, uh, Stepto had some sort of bizarre infection and ended up, ended up in a coma about a week ago. Yikes. And uh, there is uh, you fund me or something. Ask the Googles. I should have put a link in, but I didn't. Um, and it looked really bad for a couple of days, but he's now, like, eating jello and stuff. They, they weren't sure we were going to get him back. Uh, it gave me a reminder that, uh, you know, many years ago, 2008, I think it was, a bunch of us during Black Hat were hanging around Casa Fuente, as we do, drinking mojitos. We discovered that the next day was his birthday, so we all sang happy birthday. There's one of the grainiest, shakiest videos you'll ever see of about 30 hack, drunk hackers singing happy birthday to him out there. So uh, sending uh, you know, good vibes to uh, Stephen Toulouse and, uh, and you know, the whole Hacker One family and, and his, his real family. I wanted to th- kind of throw that tangent out there. So Stepto, I'm looking forward to uh, badly singing happy birthday to you again in a drunken stupor in years to come. Uh, but, you know, back to Hacker One, this, this idea that companies are out there, you know, bug crowds doing their thing. Hacker mm-hmm. One's in a different, slightly different direction. But they're, uh, you know, connecting people in a managed and managed way that doesn't end up with, uh, with, like you said, lawsuits and prison terms, right? Mm-hmm. And it's a challenge. And I think it helps us as we face things like the Wassenaar arrangement and other terrifying things uh, find a path. Uh, it doesn't reduce the terror of, of export restrictions and other things uh, for tools, but it, it shows that parts of our industry are being very responsible about discovering vulnerabilities, doing proof of concept, and helping organizations secure themselves. So I, I see Hacker One is pretty cool. When was the last time Katie was on? We should. I was just thinking the same th- thing. We should. Yeah. Uh, we should reach out to Katie and uh, and and have her yeah, uh, have her more, join yeah. us because um, um, she's out al- there. A along lot. those lines, I want to go back to um, uh, the Apple OS X vulnerability. Is it Cord or is it whatever the other name? What was the other name? Oh, uh, yeah. Zakir? Z- 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 yeah, Z- whatever. Something like that. Anyway. Uh, it what was the logo, right? Yeah, yeah it highlights something, it highlights something <laughs> interesting. The dropping zero day uh, has its advantages in this case because... Um, sure, the bad guys are going to use it to create malware, but now we have some awareness that this vulnerability exists, and we talked about that on the, the interview with Patrick uh, in, in the first segment of the show. 
But what I found interesting was if these go privately reported and unfixed, it's more dangerous because no one has awareness and we can't do anything about it. We don't have awareness that these things are possible. However, the bad guys likely do because these flaws, especially big ones and big operating systems, tend to float around on the underground probably more than people realize. So we get in the situation where the bad guys know about the vulnerabilities and all the good guys and all of the consumers of these products have no idea that this vulnerability exists. Whereas if you release it... Um, it, people know about it. Now, you could release it to the company privately, and they could take a year to fix it. And then I went back and I read the story about this Apple Cord vulnerability. It turns out they reported this bu bug to Apple, and Apple sat on it for six months. And so mm -hmm. there we have it. Now it's public. And I sometimes think, most of the time, that public is better. I don't know how you guys feel about that. It's tricky, right? Because in a perfect world, things would be different. The world we live in is not perfect, right? You well, I, I, I've not been in this position, but I could not imagine the frustration level of doing a tremendous amount of research, really working hard at, at, at determining that there is some sort of vulnerability, uh, doing a proof of concept, responsibly going to the vendor and saying, look, vendor, I've worked for, you know, Two, three months, I have discovered that there's a massive problem with your product here, here, and here, and have them sit on it for six months. Uh, six months. That, that would be incredibly frustrating, and that, that would be, for me, would make me want to go public with it. Yeah. Which and and it shouldn't do. happen that way. The, the, it should. The, they should fix it, but... The vendor so, should say, so now okay, we're presupposing that thinking. we know all their priorities. We understand what they're trying to get accomplished, what their pressures are, what their cycles look like. That's that's ridiculous. We don't. Well, know. no, 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 no. You, that, you you raise a good point, Mike. But but the um, to to be not acknowledged at all, no argument is is not acceptable. You know, so. a, a lot. I mean, a lot of times companies will come back to your point, Mike, and say. Yeah, we need three to six months to fix this. And usually yeah. the research is like, okay, you know, that's cool. I'll hold well, on to it. Well, and sometimes it's an excuse. I'm not suggesting it's and not. And sometimes it is. Sometimes they'll come back and say, so the flip side of that, Mike, is you're sitting on this O day, and they say, okay, it's going to be three months. And they're like, eh, we need another three months. Oh, we need another six months. Oh, we need another three months after that. And then the researcher loses their patience and like, look, at this point, the underground is having these awesome conversations and pointing the finger and laughing at you because they're owning all these boxes and this vulnerability that you are keep pushing me along and saying you're not going to fix. Yep. The, it, it's, yeah, God, disclosure, right? Um, yeah, it's the whole, dis I, I, I went there. The it, whole, it's a, it's well, a, it's, a difficult it, discussion. The one that drove you, there's one in my, no, I'm not a web app set guy, right? And I try, if you know uh, a lot about web application security, um, I, I don't know how you use the internet because as a non web app set guy, I, I have to like look like a, I have to browse the web like a child watching scary movies because I, I don't want to see mm. how hideous the security is, right? Well, the, it's the curse our, of knowledge. We, we have a, we have an in-depth understanding. I have one in my past uh, that, was one that I got to somebody at the company and they freaked out and then they were uh, they were actually a security with an executive in security with an executive like title and the people that developed the web stuff blew them off and then I got blown off and there was nothing I could do because I had an interesting relationship with them as both a customer and securing a franchisee of theirs. Um, so they were exposing our customers from the company that I was hired right. to protect. They were exposing me and therefore exposing the company that I drew salary from by their negligence. But since I was the only one that ever pointed it out, there was no way that it could be, you know, full disclosure wasn't an option, right? right. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's really not much I can do about it other than, then just sit on it and suck it up. And um, if there are children in the room, cover their ears. Volkswagen of America and Volkswagen Credit, fuck you. It's a decade? No. It's 12, 13 years later. I still won't give you money. I'll probably buy another Volkswagen. You have irre irrevocably lost my trust. It'll never come back because you treated me like shit. Um, and that's, you know, 
And at least you're not harboring it, Jack. I'm, I'm no, it, let, let it all out. Let it all out. Uh, well, well here's here the deal. It's, I had actually the, gotten... I, think I you might need to give him a hug. I had <laughs> actually gotten over this. And then really? uh, in the past... It sounds it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I had. <laughs> and in the past couple of years, I have realized that we have very little voice in a lot of things. So uh, Bank of America, that's right, I canceled my Bank of America card. Uh, not because I had problems with the card, but because... You have a thing that I am forced to use, which is so bad that, forget it, you're not making anything off me ever again. Comcast, when I have a choice, you don't get my money anymore. When I don't, eh, monopolies, aren't they wonderful? But yeah. you lost an account because of crap customer service. Volkswagen, you know what? Uh, you had plenty of opportunity to make this right. You never did. Um, I will give other people the money. It's like, ah, eh, we have so little thing. Why am I supporting people that screw me? Um, and so, no, it's, it, you're old is, and you it don't know small, is it oh, wait, small and petty of better. me? Yes, it is. I freely admit that. And but I still you're a say, cranky folks, old man. That's I still really say, what it boils down to. Folks, and I don't know, I haven't looked and I'm terrified to look at the VW credit website because I might be tempted to find other problems. Right. You know, so I, I get it. It's small and petty of me. I think I'm we, ranting. Lo we lost our, our Skype. Skype? Uh, yeah. We got, yeah, I'm, oh, okay, I'm there back now. Yeah. So I, I want to transition to another story where Google Good. has launched an Android bug bounty program. <laughs> now, this yeah. is kind of the flip Sprint. side of the, of the yeah. disclosure debate, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll tell you the vulnerabilities in, in the Android platform. <laughs> Sprint, AT&T, Verizon, <laughs> T-Mobile, uh, Deutsche, you know, no. Deutsche Telekom, <laughs> Orange, uh, Labara. <laughs> I, this, it, the bug bounty programs, they're becoming more popular. And it, I kind of have this like, I'm kind of on the fence about it in, in some respects. I guess you could argue either case. I mean, if this was your house, you're like, well, okay, well, anyone that breaks in my house, I'm going to give you 20 grand, right? And that's going to test the security of my house. And you're crowdsourcing it, right? Which it, it has its pluses and minuses. Like, if you did security right in the first place, maybe you still would outsource it to find those fringe cases. If I were cases, a bad person, I'd but say, you're not, oh, you mean Detroit. Yeah, um, but <laughs> you're not But you're not like hiring their expertise and just implementing it in your SDLC. You're kind yeah, of like outsourcing it. What you're describing is on-spec QA. You're, you're saying, for me to do all possible iterations of QA, it's going to cost too much money. So right. there's other people that are going to do the QA for me, whether I want them to or not. So I'll pay them. But you're only going to pay them, Mike. The thing that gets me is you only pay them if they're successful. That's the interesting thing. That's there's the lots of part. Yeah. yeah so lots it's, of researchers out there doing lots of research. But if you don't find a bug, you don't get paid. But you're so calling you just it See, this is, this is where I think we it, need it, to have a, some adult-leveled conversation. Define research Whoa, for Whoa, wait, Mike. You're on the wrong show if you want adult-level conversation. First of all, Michael, <laughs> Michael uh, <laughs> <laughs> if we're talking about a formal <laughs> bug bounty program... This is legitimate research. You're invited to test the software within a set of rules. So this now, isn't now testing is research. I mean, look, I, I well, I, it I, is. I, I think that testing, if you're researching vulnerabilities in a system within a set of guidelines within scope, you know, what's the difference between me hiring, um, you know, with the white hat or Veracode or somebody else or Sigital to do code, you know, to, to analyze the security of something? Yeah. And me doing it in a crowdsourced manner where there, you know, there's still scope, there's still rules, but there's still management. One of the advantages of the crowdsourced manner is it's always happening, right? I can go hire a, a, an external consultant for one time to say that at this point in time, here are the vulnerabilities. The advantage of the crowdsourced thing is as but, I'm making new releases, people are always testing them. But it, as long as you set the program up. I mean, you oh, can you set could them set up. A program. You, you could, could set yeah. up the programs to be extremely restrictive. But that's uh, you costly. Know, well, you can still do it in the crowdsourced. You the can crowd say well, the crowd there's, there's a credentialing. The I think there's right. a credentialing opportunity here, right? Yeah, like, that's, Jack, that's Jack, I don't, I don't, I don't, dis I don't disagree yeah. with you in the way that you're defining stuff. I, you know, I'm always interested in looking at the analogs, and I go, okay, so I know people that are cancer researchers. I know that there are pharma companies that do pharmaceutical research. There's all sorts of things, and there's, there's certain controls around it, and you don't run around and just inject people on the street and go, research! And then walk away. And I think um, I think in security we're still immature enough that we don't we call it a hacker in one paragraph, then it's a security researcher in the next paragraph, and we're doing stuff on and live and systems. And neither is accurate. Yeah, no, no. I, that's yeah. my point. I, I'm not for or against it. My, my 
purpose in a lot of this is looking at it to say, we need to get some clarity and some definition on the term. So when I see HackerOne or, I mean, look, I, I think it's interesting what Google's doing. I think it's interesting what LinkedIn's doing. I think it's all really kind of interesting. But what I look at then is to say, so what what's the definite what's the credential what's the what's the thing that allows me to ultimately demonstrate that i am separating myself as a researcher uh from a from a tester or are testers researchers and if they are that's fine i i actually this is an area that i'm still wrestling with constantly but when i when i hear a lot of the stuff i'm like yeah that sounds good but what's the other side to it and well, i, I think we need to advance to that one of the other sides to it mike is if I find a bug in Android, let's say, and my bug bounty is $20,000, and I go poking around in the black market, and I realize I can get two to three times that in the black market. Now I'm faced with an ethical issue. Do I, take I think it's a false choice. I, I think I think that there's a very small number of people. I have no research to back this, but but you know I, I get really nervous when we start suggesting. Well, they're just going to go sell them on the black market anyway, so we have to pay them. Nah, uh, no, uh, no. I think that there are people who will do that, and I think that the people who will do that will do that. Uh, regardless, I, I think yeah, that there no, are people probably, that are motivated yeah. for good stuff. You know, it's like when we say, "Well, the swag doesn't work." Well, these are well, that's not. I don't mind paying people for work on spec. I think it's. I actually think it's a really smart strategy. I just think, I think that sometimes we throw some stuff around and with with an expectation of what it means. And I, I don't know. I I I would feel more comfortable if we could get some of the terms defined, some of the processes defined, and and we're seeing that. So I, I like it. I'm not I'm not against any of this stuff. I just I have a lot of questions. I have more questions right now than I have answers. Michael, you're younger than me and have a better memory. We need to follow up offline because I, I get something yes, I might want to throw at you on this topic. Perfect. But oh, I see you have an empty is glass. It, is it in is the company's best interest to hire these people or to run these bug bounty programs? Wouldn't you well, think I mean, like, of? let me get, ask your opinion, right? So the LinkedIn, so LinkedIn had a, a public program, and then I said, you okay. know what? We were wasting a lot of time and money uh, on stuff that didn't matter, but we looked at the people who were good, and now they're part of a private program. Uh, my in initial mm, instinct on that that's was that's kind of like in between hiring someone where, and having well, a big program. Right. Yeah. That's where well, that's where you know Hacker One and, and Bug Crowd come in. They're in mm -hmm. in between. Agreed. So you have a public program. Anybody does it. You don't know who's doing it. Everybody does it. If you have a managed program, mm -hmm. so if you go, um, have we ever has case? I don't think we've ever had Casey Ellis on. Who, mm -hmm. uh, no. Their model is you come to them for a, for. A, Bug, you know, for crowdsourced bug finding, and if your if your organization is new to doing this, and you know, there are a couple of companies in the field now. Hacker One and Bug Crowd are the best known. Uh, so you go to Bug Crowd, for example, and you're like, I'm not sure this is this is not really our way of doing business, but I, I, I see the value. Mm -hmm. I understand we need to take security seriously because our refrigerators now have freaking computers in it or whatever the thing is but i'm a little scared and if you use oh, one of these companies we didn't talk about iot security or wordpress vulnerabilities this oh week dear god this is so a landmark week for security <laughs> weekly <laughs> well Word, let me WordPress. tell you no yeah. no, <laughs> no. About, we're gonna get <laughs> through this so, whole episode without talking so you about know it. you know perhaps it's uh you know an WordPress. industrial control system manufacturer trying to step in or, or just somebody that hasn't really thought about things before these companies offer you you know what? We're not going to throw it open to everybody that's registered with us. We're going to take this, you know, select 80 people to pull a number out of my ass. And we're going to let them take a look first. And, you know, we're going to show you the results before we open it up to the crowd. And we're going to kind of, you know, or, or we're going to let three people, you know, it's like, ah, we took a quick look and you've got some real fundamental stuff. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to have three people give you a list of things that probably shouldn't have ever done and they don't have the public humiliation of it. But you have some level of management. Uh, I think it right. takes... I mean, that's awesome QA that you're describing. I'm just going to throw this out because I already, I already said it. But this is where I think these companies get to play an opportunity is the credentialing to it. Because, you know, look, if, if the argument is these people exist anyway and they're just going to go to the black market, which I, I think is a specious argument. But, but then suggesting the only way for them to do something is if they're part of one of these programs is also not entirely accurate because that's not the way... So 
if if there is a marketplace to facilitate this, but then you can earn a credential, uh, and I don't mean like going to school. I just mean your results speak for themselves, and somebody else can can vouch for it. Uh, I, I think there's some real good opportunity. Jack, I love what you're describing. I I, I like the idea it's, of saying it's we're going to help you manage right. this intelligently, but but to call it anything other than than QA, I you know is, is a little well, that's uh, a little misleading. It, it it is. Yeah. Well, QA is research too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you get in, tied up in the words, but so a couple of things that happen here are um, in a managed program, you build a resume or CV of what you've found and how you've reported it that through the organization that you're using, HackerOne, uh, BugCrowd, mm -hmm. whoever, uh, you can build this list. You can have somebody that you know validates that. And people do take a path from public bug sort, you know, public uh, bug disclosure programs, bug reward programs, to working with a company to do this sort of bug hunting things, building a, a reputation for a skill set, and then pivoting that into a uh, you know a, a regular job, building it into a career path, right? And it's it's a way for people that have that I agree with application that. skill and it works a lot better if you have that level of management i think and that's why i, I think that paul we should think about getting katie back on and get, get i think uh, it'd be Chris a fun Ellison, conversation um and talk about you know where you go with these things because I, I it adds uh, a little it adds a, a big management layer to uh, a bunch of chaos and uh, the internet's chaos if we can put a little control on it no, look, I, that, that's the part that I like. And that, that's why I'm actually very specific to say, you know, this is a crowdsource, this is an outsourced QA. I think that's a good thing to be able to bring to a company. And then if, if you have the reputation to say, you know what, we're going to take a first pass at it and, th and then we're going to open up a little bit more and then we'll open up a little bit more. I mean, if, if I'm a company and I don't know how to manage this in the first place, that's, that's awesome. Uh, I mean, that, that's I think that's really valuable and, and saleable. I also then think that, if somebody wants to prove themselves in this industry and you're giving them a pathway for that, equally powerful. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of promise in it. But, you know, I, I get nervous, you know, um, I get nervous with the terms that we throw around because we're using things that that suit our needs and purposes. And uh, I know we try to be balanced, but, but there's a lot of times I, I appreciate and understand the frustrations. But I, I think when you look at it from the other side, it's equally frustrating, and so my role oftentimes is to say, what's the middle ground? How, how do we do it? I, I had a couple of stories in there that I wanted to get to before we, we close the show out. Um, one is about the research on the trade-off between free services and personal yeah. data. And one of the things they found was that people who know about ways in which marketers use their personal information are more likely, rather than less likely, to accept discounts in exchange for data when presented. So essentially what this means is the more I know about what you're going to do with my data, the more likely I am to trust you, even if you are selling that data or doing things with that data that I normally would Because you told me right up front. Yeah. yeah. Now, the interesting thing is the EFF and the ACLU have appealing a case in California and this is a question that people were asking, well, what data are you storing? How long are you storing it for? And what are you using it for? Oh, questions. God. And, you know, California, right, comes back and says, well, we're taking pictures of their license plates. Yeah, I don't really know how long we're storing it for. And yeah, I don't really want to tell you what we're using it for. Independent third party does the research and figures out that, like, something like 0.16% of car thefts were, a, were in the database of license plates. So the, uh, the usefulness of this data to the find stolen cars um, is not, not is so near great. zero. It's important to actually give the full number there. You're talking point, uh, 0 0.16 hits per 4.6 million records from the Oakland Police Department. Jesus. Thank you, Kevin. 4.6 million records. Well, yeah. the, the interesting thing is I don't know who thought this was a good idea because any law enforcement personnel that work auto theft know that, you know, there are a couple of, you know, there are a handful of broad categories. There's the there's the joy riders. the joy ride and then there's the i need you know I, i've i've i run a kind of sketchy body shop and i need a tailgate rear bumper and rear quarter for you know a, a 2011 lexus whatever mm -hmm. and so somebody goes and grabs one of those cars and 
the parts that aren't used have the VIN numbers scraped from them mm -hmm. and are stacked elsewhere. And the rest of the car is uh, shredded, cut into small bits. You know, ID pieces are come out and uh, poof, gone. You know, the cars vanish from mm -hmm. the world. Um, mm -hmm. And that's that's just the nature of it. it it's interesting. If you want to you want to rant, see uh, a resident of Massachusetts, see how bad the Massachusetts uh, state police in particular um, are about FOIA requests and things. They're just an absolute stonewall. Hmm. So, yeah, that, that and who controls that? You know, I remember over you right. know, like who a decade ago, one police department that was a customer of ours at a previous employer did it themselves. You know, they got some sort of funding and they did it. And so... Small town police department was doing, you know, they were cruising the mall, scanning every license plate. Mm -hmm. They weren't really sure what they were going to do with the data unless they got a hit. It's like, oh. So the, there's been a, a shift recently. The license plate reader kind of uh, a thing's been out for a couple years now, but it's now starting to get traction within the at least the, the legislation or, or lawsuit perspective. Uh, but private companies now are the loophole for this. So you'll actually see this here in downtown Boston. There'll be cars driving around with license plate readers. They'll take that information and then they'll sell it to the police department. Right. It's a way of getting around this entire loophole. So right. Right. Uh, now hey, it's and, not just law right. enforcement. Speaking of that, I saw, the, I saw the Bing, the Bing van. Right. It was Bing and it was taking pictures like like Google does. Yeah, I didn't realize Bing was doing that too. Yeah. That was pretty funny. But the other thing about the, the uh, private license plate readers is in the Northeast here we have um, – Easy Pass, uh, you know, the, the transponders mm -hmm. on our cars. Right. But once you get, like, into Florida and a lot of southern states and some western states, they don't use those. They just use license plate readers. Right. Uh. So they read your license plate everywhere, uh, and that's how they, they track you. Um, and so they've got data on who's where and when for billing purposes. But, you know, is there a correlation... How does that work? You know, well, uh, Easy Pass is reading the license plates too. If if your tag isn't, the yeah, Easy with, Pass does both to to cross reference, and so they yeah. they haven't got upset with me. But you know, I'm, I'm down a car, so the transponder moves from car to car, and I always just I always make sure the green light turns on so they don't yell at. Well, me. Well, yeah, no, they're yeah they're they're pretty cool. Like you can have multiple transponders to the account and and multiple plates to the account, and as long as the, any of those combinations are valid, they're they're good with it. Right, but but they're also the, all of the northeast states and all the way down uh, 95 anybody using easy they're all uh, taking photographs you know what right. i haven't paid close attention to though are they doing that on the high speed lanes too do they have high speed cameras in i'm they assuming must. they, they do and yeah. they all i to. can say is i'm not a uh, there's not a whole lot about new jersey that i like sorry if you live there <laughs> but nice. you don't have to slow down much in new yeah. jersey to go through those gates right and i appreciate that cuz the more i slow yeah. down in new jersey the longer i'm in new jersey <laughs> <Delaware's> <laughs> uh, getting there right you know which, <laughs> which hate mail you're just making fans this whole I, show I guess, <laughs> that's what i do i love new jersey for the cheap cheap fuel taxes cuz i mean there's there it's the and it's all full service and it's all full service right i mean you, you go you it's whip weird, in man. there and it's uh, it's it's cheap and somebody pumps it for you and, uh, you can't actually pump it's against state law to pump it's it yourself. Law. Yeah, you yeah. cannot they get they get cranky at you if you get out of your car oh, yeah, yeah. yeah they don't want you to get out of your car no no that's um that's true so um we're, we're out of booze it must be means must mean that it's time Wait, to know, wind I down the show we're going to have to end the show i, I um, guess we are so what did you think of the uh, I, race this, condition it was awesome is so, this your this is my so, condi so I, this is um i i use cold brew coffee and a decent rum in this case i'm using mount gay so I use a couple ounces of a, of a cold brew coffee, um, and I, in this case, using the, the high test cold brew from Trader Joe's. But two ounces of uh, cold brew, two ounces of a decent rum, and uh, just to soften it up a little bit, a little bit of um, simple syrup made with succinate, a, a raw, you know, like or turbinado, a raw sugar, mm -hmm. just for a little sweetness, take the edge off, and so it it, it tastes like coffee, but it's. Uh, Half you, you rum. finished with a, an orange peel? Just a little extra. Yeah, put a little citrus. Uh, Did you light it on fire first? Or? No, I didn't. Mm -hmm. I, I probably should have flamed it for this <laughs> just to give it some... Uh, You're slipping, Jack. To, You're just slipping. to give it some character. But, uh, yeah, so the race condition, I named it. That's a race condition, right. Right, because we have alcohol and caffeine it's like slugging that, it out. What was that drink? There was a high-energy drink with uh, alcohol in it. What was it called? 
Four Loco. Loco. Four yeah. Loco. Yeah. It's your version of Four Loco. Right, except it tastes good. It's like good. Four Loco for adults. It's, it t- except it tastes good. Yeah, I will say this. It's very good. A uh, decent cold brew is good. A decent rum makes it good. Do not sit around and drink six or eight of them because the caffeine <clears throat> and alcohol are yeah. still in your system. And you can't hydrate enough to get your head not to be in agony. Or over your that. heart stop. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. that was the thing with Four Locos. Kids were like knocking Kids back, were killing them. themselves. Yeah. 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 Kids were literally killing themselves. But, you know, that's all right. There are too many children. No, I mean, uh, <laughs> that's terrib- That's a terrible <laughs> tragedy. <laughs> okay. With that, we're going to end the show. <laughs> Thanks to our Jack lovely Skype Daniel. panel, Mr. Santarcangelo, not uh, Kevin and Joff, Miss Jack Daniel here in studio. Thanks, everyone. Over and out. out. Oh, I want to take us out. Over and out. Yeah. Everyone say it. Over and out. Over and out. We're going to crowdsource. Up and left. Out. Up and left. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, everybody. <laughs>